Hey, what's up, gang? I am so pumped today for this conversation with Joe Applebaum. We talk, we go so deep on the personal growth journey in all the inner stuff, all that figuring out who we are in life and, and dealing with all the questions, the purpose. And he's a, an amazing entrepreneur. He's an amazing uh, content producer. He's got a, a phenomenal brand. He's a top expert on LinkedIn, all of that stuff. We get into some of that stuff too, but mainly that big, deep, juicy inner stuff that really makes a difference, the stuff that really moves the needle here. So, so grateful to him for taking the time to do this. And honestly, guys, with everything that's going on in the world right now, this is the kind of work that we all need to do. This is the kind of work that makes a difference. This is the kind of work that heals people, that heals the nation. The only way that we heal as a nation is by healing ourselves individually, one person at a time. It's the only way it's gonna happen, guys. So dive into this one and keep your ears freaking peeled. We each have our own gift to give and yours is unique. What reality you want to create? That's your choice, always. No one can take that from you. So welcome, Joe. So essentially we met in Mexico and Cabo what is that, two months back now or something like that? Yeah, in January. Uh, now it's March. So yeah, two months ago. Yeah. Just as this coronavirus thing was breaking out, you know, and we didn't know it, you know, nobody knew it at that time. And you just struck me as someone that has like this, this uh, inner fire about you. Like you were, you were always like breaking ice with people. You were always, you know, showing up and like everywhere you went, you were just sort of elevating the energy of, of the location of the people around you, of the room. So that's why I wanted you on here. So theme being ignite your fire. You seem to have some fire going, man. Tell us about yourself. All right. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. My name is Joe Applebaum. I run a company called Ajax Union and I'm excited about life very much now than I have been in the past. You know, I just turned 40, as you know, but, you know, thinking back in my 20s and my 30s, I was always a happy-go-lucky person, but I never lived a life where I absolutely knew that I wanted to be where I was in that moment. I never lived a life where I 100% felt responsible for my life. I never lived a life where I knew that if I wanted to have power, if I wanted to have freedom, if I wanted to be fully self-expressed, that I had the right to do that. And I was the one that can give myself permission to just be myself and just show up fully wherever I am as much as I want to be. So now I'm in a place where like, wow, I can literally create anything I want in my life. And it's not just a matter of circumstance. It's not just a matter of giving up responsibility or hoping and wishing for something, but it's me taking ownership of that. Growing up in my mother's store, I saw her rely a lot on luck. And I saw her also not really trust other people. And I saw her not be willing to change. And in today's economy, if you ain't going to change, you're going to die pretty quickly. If not from a virus, maybe from some financial struggles or whatever. Mm. So, so you got to change. You got to trust, right? You got to trust the government. You got to trust people because so many people are saying, oh, this whole virus thing is made up and da, 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 and there's lack of trust. And if there's a lack of trust, there's no connection. No connection, there's no intimacy, and so there's no business. So you have to be able to have a certain level of trust. And of course, if you're relying on luck, then you're basically saying that the world decides if you're worthy or not. And watching my mother do that, I realized very quickly that strategy is really going to be the key. Luck is a great thing, but energy without strategy is a waste of time. And the right strategy will actually save you a decade. And so I saw my mother for 10 years trying to build her business and she couldn't get to the million dollar mark. And eventually she went out of business on 9-11 when we had that pandemic and then tourists weren't coming anymore to her stores. She had a store in the Lower East Side and she went out of business. And I said, when I get into my business, when I figure out what I want to do with my life, I'm going to have a solid strategy. So when I launched my business, I was able to build Ajax Union to be one of the fastest growing companies in the US within 18 months. That's kind of like where we were from when I started working full time in the business within 18 months, we were number 178 on the Inc 500. So I look back to ask myself, how the heck did I do that? Because while I was doing it, I didn't really, it's not like I sat there and said, oh my gosh, I know exactly what I want to do. But after I started self-reflecting a couple of years ago to write my books and the things that I've done, I started seeing a pattern. I started seeing that there were seven things, seven stages that I had to go through in order for me to go from average Joe to CEO, in order for me to have that passion, to have that purpose, 
to have myself be on fire, it's not just about making money because you can make money and still be miserable. And mm -hmm. it's not just about success and hitting your goals because lots of people hit their goals. And then when they hit their goal, they're like, wow, is that all there is? They've ever heard of celebrities that are depressed and that commit suicide. It happens all the time. That are drug mm -hmm. overdosing. It happens all the time. So it's not just about success. It's also about something deep down inside called fulfillment that if you can really figure out the art for yourself, what fulfillment means for you, you're probably the luckiest person in the world. I love that. I love what you were saying. So going back to something you said in the beginning there, you found out how to give yourself permission to just be you. Talk about that. Yeah. So for the longest time, I, you know, because I grew up in a, in a, in a Jewish, in an Orthodox Jewish household. I was taught that the purpose of life is to become a rabbi. And if you don't mm -hmm. live to certain dogmatic principles, certain rules, then you're not living a meaningful life. And when I started getting a taste of business back in my 20s, I started realizing that although I have rabbinical training and I do love teaching and I do love inspiring what I love more than anything in the world is creating value for other people through some type of business. And I love IT, I love technology, I love marketing. And so I decided that I'm going to get into this, but I've always felt like a little bug inside me bugging me saying, you know, this is not the ultimate purpose in life. This is not what you should be doing. So I felt a lot of confusion between the fusion of spirituality and the fusion of just being out there in the workplace and just making money and just, you know, be networking and building relationships. And there were a lot of contrasts that I saw where I was doing things that weren't necessarily okay with the way that I was brought up, you know, getting out of my comfort zone, mingling with people that weren't Jewish and like lots of different things that I had, that I really enjoyed doing, getting out there into the world and seeing the world. And what I realized is that the opinions of other people are none of my business. And I can still keep my faith at the level that I want to keep my faith. And I still can create my own connection with spirituality and with God and my own way to inspire other people and myself if I can just take away the self-judgment because no one's really judging me. People are only judging me within this, the world of them judging themselves. So they see me through their own eyes about how they see themselves. So they end up judging me. So that's something that I realized a couple of years ago. And then I basically how said- How did you realize that? I realized it through a combination of reading books, going to therapy, hiring coaches, going to programs like Tony Robbins and Landmark, and also helping a lot of other people with their own self-shame, with their own mm -hmm. self-judgment. So ultimately- Was there a moment? Was there a specific shifted? moment? I think there was one moment I was standing in a group where there were quite a few moments, but if, I, if, you, if, there, if you want to bring it down to one moment, there was a moment where I was standing in a group of 193 people. There were 193 people sitting around me and I got up to the mic and this was a coaching group where we meet for 40 hours um, and people go up to the mic and they start talking about their issues in their life and the things that are frustrating them. And Hopefully, with the coach, they're able to coach you to create a breakthrough in your life. And so I get up and I start talking about my history and the fact that my first child was a stillbirth and how hard it was for me and how I couldn't, how I can't live with it. And it's so difficult for me to be able to live with that. And I started getting choked up in front of 193 people and I started to almost cry, right? I felt a lump in my throat and I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't. I feel like I have to cry. And the coach said, so cry. And I just started crying. Even in the moment right now, I feel super emotional. Like I want to cry a little bit. And the coach was like, just cry. And I was like, why? It's not okay for a man to cry. And at that point, as soon as I said that, I was like, what the hell is that? Like, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. And I, what I realized that I have all these self-limiting beliefs around what it means to be a man, what it means to be a Jew, what it means to be a, a member of society, what it means to be a CEO, what it means to be a leader, what it means to be a father, all these self judgments created by other human beings accidentally, all these patterns and all these beliefs. And so in that moment, the coach basically said, crying is beautiful. Crying is something that you just have, you, you can attach a reason to why you're crying, but you're feeling an emotion now. And when you're dead, you're not going to feel any emotion. So whatever emotion you feel, just feel the emotion and let it pass because you suppressing it 
you suppressing your self-expression, you're supp- you suppressing your feelings is only going to create that energy inside you where you're stuck, where you have like this block. And if you don't want to be blocked, if That's you want to be free, if you want to be open, if you want to be powerful, if you want to be connected to the energy source, to God, then you can't block this feeling that you have. You have to allow it to flow. So now I just allow it to flow. And I realized the only thing that was stopping me from allowing it to flow is shame. And so, you know, hearing that and seeing and that, that was one very powerful moment because I started becoming okay crying in front of a crowd of people. And often when I tell my story about my stillbirth, I often start crying and I shed a few tears and other people mirror me and they start crying. But then we create an emotional bond that we have forever. So it's this beautiful thing that I never had access to when I was full of, you know, you have to be this leader, you have to be power. Even now, right? There's a coronavirus. My business is going to be impacted April 1st. I'm expecting a 50% decline in reoccurring revenue. Mm. I mean, that is wow, right? Most people would be on the ground crying and like not knowing what to do with themselves. But I'm super positive. I'm super excited right now. And I'm and and the fact is I'm sharing this with my top 300 people that I know. Why? Because those are the people that are going to help me. People are like, what can I do to support you? I was like, here's how you, what you can do. Here are three things you can do. Mm-hmm. And people are making introductions. I just closed a $10,000 a month retainer today from somebody who I told that I'm going to, that this is going to be happening to me in April. And they introduced me to somebody who desperately needs to build a marketing funnel for their business. So we're going to generate more revenue now than we would have generated even in this month alone as a result of me just being vulnerable and sharing. Because you know what? The truth is, I don't want to share that something bad is happening. I don't want to share that I'm going to have a loss of revenue. That makes me look less of a leader. That makes me look less of an entrepreneur would be the natural feeling that I have inside. But the truth is, when I do share, when I do connect, when I am vulnerable, that's when I get the support that I need. That's when I'm able to grow. And that's when I inspire other people to do the same. So it's about integrity. That's a that's a, a super amazing. I love that. So, before that moment, had you like not cried for a long time, or was it because there was it crying in front of other people that was the? Challenge? Yeah, I, I I think that you know, growing up, my mother always said, "Men don't cry. Grown men mm. don't cry." So she she taught me to suppress my emotions. And your a lot. dad didn't cry, cry either. Like he no, I've that. never really seen my dad cry. I never saw my mom cry. I never really saw men cry at all in general. I saw women cry. Mother would cry all the time. My sister was, would cry all the time. But me and my brother, we would never really cry. I mean, I've, I've cried in my life. When I've gotten bullied when I was younger, I cried. I remember moments that I got punched in the stomach and I was on the ground crying. I remember when I had my children. Every time I had a child, I cried uncontrollably. But it came from joy and nobody was there except for a nurse who gave me a tissue. And, you know, and the doctor, he's like, oh, that's so beautiful. And I was okay with it because I was just, I was elated with happiness. But when something terrible happens in my life, I would, I'm more of the person who runs away from it rather than mm-hmm. faces it or cries. You know, mm-hmm. I come up with a plan, I put on my game face and I just go for it. And although I want to feel like crying, I never gave myself the permission to cry. And now I give myself permission. So if I feel like I want to cry, I will sit down and I will just bawl right now. And that is okay. I love that. Yeah. That was something that was super challenging for me, right? For years and years and years as an adult, I didn't cry. And I had these moments where I could feel that there were kind of tears pressing, but I couldn't get myself to cry. Even if I, I wanted to, because I could feel that it would feel good, but I just couldn't get myself. I couldn't, I couldn't make it happen. So yeah, a huge breakthrough for me when I got access to that again, when I was able to cry again. So talk to me about the spirituality and, you know, spirituality and business, you know, spirituality and marketing, spirituality and entrepreneurship. That's something that, that I'm super curious about myself, right? Like my life purpose I discovered in 2008 is like integrating spirituality and entrepreneurship. So how do you see that, especially, you know, being growing up in a very Jewish environment? Yeah. So there, what I realized is a very big difference between being religious and being spiritual. And that's something I never really knew there was a distinction between the two. Mm-hmm. Being spiritual means being in touch with the spirit. And being religious means having a set of rules that you abide to. And hopefully you can have integrity with those rules religiously, as they say, you know, you're super strict with a certain set of code of ethics and values and so on. So being spiritual, if you want to bring spirituality into business, for me, and everybody has their own way of being in touch with their spirit, 
it has to do with being able to connect with what is untangible in business. So certain elements of emotional awareness is spiritual. Certain elements of connectivity with other people and really getting in tune with them is spiritual. Going above and beyond and not just having a tit-for-tat relationship with somebody is a spiritual thing for me, at least. Not for everybody. I believe that giving is spiritual and being Mm -hmm. there for somebody is a beautiful spiritual thing. It might not be a religious thing, but it's a spiritual thing. So Mm -hmm. when you have gratitude, I believe gratitude is spiritual. When you have the ability to appreciate and to praise and to connect and to give charity and to do good and to mentor and to support other people, I believe that there is a major spiritual element, although there is some religious element to that as well, it's more spiritual in my opinion than it is religious. And so for me, being able to be spiritual, it means being in touch with what's higher than you, with what with the untangible, with something that is powerful that you feel deep down inside. And this whole concept of purpose that human beings are after, you know, the Mark, Mark Twain had a saying. He said the two most important days in a man's life, and I would change it to a person's life because, you know, in today's day and age, the two most important days in a person's life is the day that they're born and the day that they find out why. And the question I have for you and for anybody else listening to this is why is finding out why you're born just as important or almost as important as the day that you're born. Why is purpose so important? It's because we are driven to do things for reasons. As human beings, this is how we're programmed. As a matter of fact, there's a man that wrote a book called Influence, and he talks about the six different ways to influence human beings. And a very powerful book. Robert Cialdini. Exactly. So he wrote this book, and His first example is if you're standing in line to make copies at a copier, if you remember that, and and you want to break the line, if you're just going to walk over and say, hey, can I just cut the line? People are going to say no. Most of the time, people are going to say no. But if you give them a reason, even if it's a ridiculous reason, if it's a very important reason, but even if it's a ridiculous reason, like I want to, can I cut the line because I'm, I'm in a rush or because I want to cut the line or whatever it is. The example in the book is like, because I need to make copies, which is yeah. like, dude, it's a copier, right? <laughs> it's so obvious. Yeah. But if you want to influence yourself and influence other people, you need to have a strong why. And this was a concept mm-hmm. that was around forever. Simon Sinek branded it with start with why, but ultimately we do things for a reason. We do things for a purpose. And even in Viktor Frankl, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he talks about this whole idea of having a purpose, having a mission. And if, if you have a mission in life and you have a purpose in life, you're much more likely to be able to go through very difficult times in your life. Pain is not acceptable. And it's actually suffering if it doesn't have a purpose. Pain with a purpose can equal progress in your life because at least you have a reason why you're doing it. And now you can go through a tremendous amount of pain. So purpose is really important. The thing is people confuse purpose with wants. People confuse purpose with needs. People confuse purpose with just like regular things. Purpose is something that if you do not find automatically, which most people won't, purpose is something you have to discover on your own. You can't even create a purpose. Purpose is not something you can create. It's something you need to discover within yourself and I'll give you guys a hint because I've done a lot of study in this and I've, I've done a lot of coaching both for myself and for my students and for many entrepreneurs. And what I find is that when you figure out what your strengths are and your weaknesses, because every weakness reflects a strength and every strength reflects a weakness, when you decide what your values are, when you discover those values that are not just permission to play values that everyone needs to have, kind of like you know integrity or, or, or honesty or whatever it is, but values based on the things that you need to behave in a certain way, the things that you value more than anything else in the world that you cannot live without, that you cannot be free without, that you cannot be powerful without, and you put language to those values. When you start discovering what your commitments are in life, what you're really committed to, what your agreements are, not the agreements that you've been given from a religious standpoint or a dogmatic standpoint, but the, the agreements that you decided are most important based on your values and based on your strengths because nobody wants to be doing things they're not good at. Now you're living a life that's more aligned with your purpose. And when you combine your past history and the struggles that you've been through and the breakthroughs that you've had, and then you go back and you're able to use your strengths and your values and your agreements, and you combine all that together and you look back and you're able to make a spiritual difference for other people, 
then you're living your purpose. And I found for myself that when I help hungry entrepreneurs go from frustration to motivation, I am living my purpose. So people say, Joe, I heard you say that your kids are your purpose. And I used to always preach, my kids are my purpose. I do everything for my kids. I make money for my kids. What I realized that when I was 20, when I was 30, my kids were my purpose. And I love my kids very much to the end of the world. And my kids are part of my purpose. But ultimately, what brings me the most fulfillment in my life is not necessarily changing diapers. It's not necessarily bathing kids. I can hire someone to help me do that. I can't hire somebody to help me play ball with my kid. I'm going to do that. But helping hungry entrepreneurs, supporting hungry entrepreneurs to go from frustration to motivation, that's something that I want to get on the front lines and do. That's mm-hmm. something that is my strength, that is aligned with my values, that is aligned with my, my wounds from the past and the experiences that I've learned how to be able to grow businesses, how to be able to go from frustration to motivation, be able to go through those seven stages to seven figures. And as a result... I'm able to teach that to the world. I'm able to inspire in a spiritual way and also use all the training that I had in my life growing up in yeshiva and growing up and going to Israel to study to be a rabbi, using all that together to be able to support other people. For me, that's my purpose. And that's why I believe purpose is so important. And if you can find your purpose, you're going to have more freedom, you're going to have more power, and you're going to be able to express yourself at levels that you never imagined possible. Right. So when did, when did you discover your purpose and what made you start looking for that? I think that the first moment of my self-awareness w- when it came to trying to find my purpose was when Google contacted me. So I grew one of the fast growing companies in the US. And one day we were helping this rabbi with his program. He came into our organization and I often volunteered to help you know, community leaders be able to market themselves pro bono. So he came in and we gave him lots of tips, how he can leverage his 18,000 constituents and so on. And at the end, he's like, I want to give you guys a blessing. I know that you're not going to accept any money from me because you have a very successful business and money doesn't really you know, matter so much to you right now, but I want to give you guys a blessing. And he said, you should be very successful. And he's about to walk out. And my partner at the time, he's like, you know, he's like, no, 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 you can't get away with a simple blessing like that. You need to give us an intricate blessing. Let me walk you around our company we have 50 people over here. Let, let me walk you around. Let me show you our company. And then you give us an intricate blessing. So he walked him around. He spent two minutes walking around the company. And then he said, he turned to both of us and he said, you guys should be able to inspire tens of thousands of people, be able to make a real difference in the world and be able to live a life of meaning and purpose. Okay. And then my partner was like, okay. He shook his hand and he left. And a few minutes later, I looked at my phone and I got an email from Google And it said, would you like to be a certified Google trainer? We're looking for people to teach business owners about Google's products and services. Now, I had no idea what a certified Google trainer was. Didn't exist at the time. And I also thought to myself, you know, I don't even know what a seminar is. They wanted us to do seminars on behalf of Google. I've never led a seminar. I've never been to a seminar. I never did networking or anything like that. I'm a pretty new entrepreneur. Let me see what this is about. I asked my partner what he thinks. He's like, if he's going to get us in front of, if Google's going to get us in front of business owners, let's do it. Who knows what it is? Who cares? So we went there. They trained us to be certified Google trainers. And then they basically said, you guys rent the room, we'll fill the room. So I said, let's go to Madison Square Garden and see if we can rent it. So me and my partner went to Madison Square Garden. We realized they had 27,000 seats. And unfortunately, they were on construction at the time. They were like redoing Madison Square Garden. So we couldn't rent out Madison Square Garden. So we went back to Google and we said, we can't, we can't rent that Madison Square Garden. They're like, we didn't mean that big. Get a room with 50 to 100 people. We'll fill the room for you. So we said, okay. So the next best thing is we went to the Jewish Children's Museum in Brooklyn. <laughs> they had 75 seats and we re- rented the place and Google filled the room up, $50 a person. Google filled the whole room up. They said, you keep the fees and you do whatever you want. You could sell them whatever you want. Just train them about Google AdWords and about SEO and the importance of Google and so on. So we made the registration page on Eventbrite. We sent it to Google. Google promoted it to their AdWords customers and the room was filled within minutes. We sold out. Awesome. I'm about to get on stage to do a presentation about something that I'm an expert in. SEO, PPC, whatever, right? I'm about to get... I start shaking. I don't know what's going on. My entire body starts shaking. I look at my partner and I'm like, I can't do this. He's like, oh, no problem. We'll just refund everyone. He knew that would that would make <laughs> he knew that would make me just do it. I said, "All right, I'm going to do this." So I get up and I do it anyway. And I'm pacing. I remember like my friends were there, my family was there. They were watching. They're like, "What is going on with him?" He's usually this really super confident guy. My heart was racing. 
but I made it through my portion of it. It was an hour and a half me, an hour and a half my partner. And I remember walking out um, after mine and I was like thinking to myself, what is going on? I got to look into this. I need therapy or something. Because at that point, I always thought all therapists are crazy. All coaches are nuts. Like there's no way that I'm going to do it. But I started what, researching. What year was this? When was this? This was 2011, 2011. Mm-hmm. Okay, this was 2000, yeah, 2011, end of 2011. Anyway, so I realized that I had a tremendous amount of fear of public speaking. That was my first time where I started. So I started researching this and I started realizing that 90% of people would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. This is the reality of life, as Jerry Seinfeld says. So I started researching this and I realized that I am one of the 90% of people. It's a normal thing and I probably shouldn't be doing public speaking if I'm afraid of it. But then I said, you know what? I need to learn how to do this because this is going to change my business. If Google can fill rooms for me, I need to start doing this. So I committed to doing one every two weeks. My partner's like, no, we shouldn't do this one every two weeks. We should do this one every two months. I said, no, we need to go all in on this while Google still has this program because Google is known for starting programs and stopping programs. Anyway, we started doing it once every two weeks. We rented the Hilton and we rented the New Yorker Hotel and we rented a bunch of like every place that we could find. Madison Square Garden? We, we didn't get to Madison Square Garden because it turns out that Google can't fit 27, they, they could barely fit 300 people in a room. Then they wouldn't be able to, there weren't that many business owners that were interested in SEO and PPC. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so they would fill up 200, 300 people for us, but that was the max. You know, we, they wouldn't sell, sell out after a while. There was a law of diminishing returns at a certain point. Right. So, but we would fill up rooms, it was beautiful. You imagine having two, 300 people come to a room and they all pay 50 to $80 to get in and then they hear my sales pitch, basically, right? That was amazing times. And we continued mm-hmm. to grow the company. We serviced over 1,100 companies. And that was a really big part of what we were doing. And so it was a beautiful time. And I also learned a lot about myself during that time. I learned that I had, you know, I learned that I was 95 pounds overweight at that time. I didn't know that before. I was. Uh, what does that mean? How, how did you not know that? I was just completely oblivious. I was just eating and eating and eating and eating and eating and not exercising and smoking and like doing all types of stuff. And you didn't realize that that was not... It wasn't even on my radar. I was just like, just work, just make money. Mm-hmm. That's all. And I was like one of those... So funny, because so, I, wasn't, I was never that overweight, but I, wasn't, I was out of shape and I didn't like to work out much. And I remember the first time I learned that there's like, you've got upper, middle and lower abs. I mean, like, wait, is that a thing? Like, I, I had no idea. That's not that long ago, right? It's a, it's a lack of awareness. I mean, it was all right. lack of awareness. I had no idea that I had fear. I didn't know what fear was. That's the truth. Mm-hmm. I, had no, I had no idea that I had emotions. The first time I went to a therapist and I went to a good therapist that charged $300 an hour, and he's like, you know, you have emotions, right? So I was like, I don't have emotions. I'm a man. Men don't have them. He's like, no, you don't understand something. He's like, you have emotions called fear and love. And there's 10 different uh, power. And, and I started researching this and I started becoming like obsessed with it. Just like everything that I research, I become obsessed with it. And I become like a little mini therapist, right? And I started researching how you can create emotions and how emotions drive action and like all this stuff. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, I have a belief system. Oh my God, I can change my belief system. Oh my God, it drives my habits and my character. I started freaking out. And I was like, if I can rewire myself to lose weight, if I can rewire myself to become intelligent, if I can rewire myself to be able to go a public speaker, to be able to do podcasts, to be able to not be afraid of social media, to be able to not be afraid of being on video or being on podcasts or or the opinions of other people. If I can do that, I can do anything. I can inspire the world and I can live the life of my dreams. Oh my goodness, how can I not do this? And at that point, I just became committed, all in obsession into personal development and I completely revamped who I am. That's so amazing. Like paint, paint us a picture. Like what were you like before that? Like what was a day in your life and what was your inner state? And Yeah, so you? a day in my life was wake up as late as possible because I stayed up to burn the midnight oil till three in the morning often playing video games and, you know, often working, but, you know, just like, you know, eating lots of potato chips. And I used to love wise onion garlic potato chips. I would wake up as late as possible. Um, I remember like my wife nagging me, like, get out of bed, get out of bed, get out of bed, get out of bed. It's 930. You're late for work. Get out of bed. And I'll be like, ah, there's two more minutes. You know, so I would just basically just like lay there, not make my bed, get up, put on my schlubby clothing, go to the bakery, pick up a Danish and some orange juice come into the office all late with my hair all messy 
and basically just make it through the day, really low energy, try to make sales. What was your inner state like? <laughs> there were days where I was totally on and totally motivated. And there were days where I was totally depressed and totally, it mm -hmm. would just, it, I would just hope for the best. And I knew, and I was smoking a lot. I was always outside smoking cigarettes. I remember people walking over to me saying, Hey, stop smoking. I was like, who are you? You know, more people die from telling people to stop smoking. Than for, <laughs> than for the smokers. And they would be like, oh my God, was that a death threat? I was like, no, I'm just talking like it's a famous Italian saying. It was like, I'm not even in Little Italy here. What are you talking? Anyway, so I was, a ve I was always into jokes and I was always into making comedy and I was always into that, but I was more of a one-on-one -on -one type of person. You put me, in, even in front of my own employees, I had 50, 75 people. I couldn't get in front of them without shaking and shivering and like being all in my head about it. I wasn't authentic and my employees knew it they knew that I wasn't authentic and I didn't have a real relationship with them and I couldn't support them because I couldn't even support myself. And I was very insecure and I was very scared. I would not want to take a picture of myself. I would not want anyone to put me on video. I was afraid of all that. I was afraid of what people, I was afraid of not even knowing what I was afraid of. And mm -hmm. I thought, I honestly thought that the money that I was making and I was making really good money, the money that I was making was on me just being lucky. I didn't know that I actually had a strategy. Now, in the back of my head, I was very strategic. I was very, very strategic, always strategic with money, always strategic in business, not very strategic in health, but always very strategic, not very strategic in my relationships, but always very strategic in business, in my business relationships. Was that a family trait? Was that something that you learned growing up? Being strategic was a survival mechanism for me. So when I was in school, I had a teacher who asked me to read. Okay, this is an early, early memory of like third grade or second grade. He asked me to read. And I always wanted to read fast, but I never really was able to read fast. So when I got up to read, I was reading really poorly because I was trying to read fast to sound smart. And my teacher told me, he, what, he, what my teacher probably told me was, please sit down, you're done. What I heard was, you're such a dumbass. You don't know how to read. Please don't ever read again. Sit down. That's what I thought I heard. And that was the memory of it. Obviously, a teacher would never say that to a student, but that's what I remembered. And so I always thought I'm just a dumbass. And the reoccurring thought in my head is you're a dumbass. So in fourth grade, I decided I am going to prove to the world that I am not a dumbass. And I became the smartest kid in the class, even outsmarting the teacher and becoming the class clown. So I would pick everything up quickly. I was a class of 30 people. I'd pick it up right away. And then I would be like, all right, I got this. And I would start doing spitballs and farts and all types of stuff to make the class laugh because I wanted to show how smart I was. And I would get kicked out. So every year I'd get kicked out. And in eighth grade, I got kicked out, but I was also the valedictorian. So they had to bring me back. So because I was the smartest kid in the class, or at least I promoted myself as that. And the teachers knew. And the, I remember the teacher, I remember a teacher in eighth grade, he said, Joe, he didn't call me Joe then at that point, but he, he sat me down and he said, you know, you're a really sharp kid. You're really, really smart. If you set goals in your life, you can literally accomplish anything you want. Why don't you set a goal right now? And I'll be back in a few minutes. And I thought to myself at that point, I remember thinking to myself, my goal is to get out of this room and never see this teacher again. <laughs> and when I left that room, I never saw the teacher again. That was my goal. And I was done with it. I was done with school. I got kicked out of every school. My parents sent me to Montreal. I got kicked out. They sent me to South Africa. I got kicked out. They sent me to a school in Brooklyn. I got kicked out. They sent me to Israel. In Israel, I somehow made it. I got kicked out of one school, but I somehow made it. And I got my rabbinical degree last minute. I was like, you know what? Let me just get this and get it done with. But at the end of the day, I just, I, I didn't, I don't like authority. That's something that I repel. And as an entrepreneur, it makes perfect sense. But then I didn't really understand myself. And I didn't understand the urge that I had to be free. And I was looking for all types of exits, exits like alcohol, exits like, uh, like smoking cigarettes, exits, you know, lots of different exits for me to kind of run away. Video games was a great exit. I'm amazing at video games. So looking back at my life, I had this like thorn to try to be smart. And that's why I became so strategic. And that's why I am so strategic. And that's why when you put me in a room with people, you know, I don't know if you remember this, but when you gave your talk in Cabo, People looked at me and they're like, damn, that guy knows shit, right? That guy's like, I, I, want, I want to talk to this guy. As a matter of fact, you even wanted me on your podcast after because that's my, my, I have to be that way. I have to be the smartest person. That's just what I have to be. And for me, it is a competition because one of my top five strengths, believe it or not, is competition. There are 34 human strengths. If you do the strength finder, which you probably know about, 
Yeah. Gallup Center has this, and I do this for all my employees because I need to know which one of my employees are achievers, which my em- my employees are relators, which one of my employees are futuristic ideators, which one of my employees are are people that are going to start things and not be able to finish things like me. So I need to put the right butts in the right seats, and I need to know people's strengths. So, you know, that's basically the idea. Mm. Tell me about like what, what, so in that journey, it's like, it's an incredible journey that you've been on from, from where you were, right? You're painting that picture to who you are today and, and, you know, how are you showing up right now? How I saw you in Cabo. What are sort of some of the, the darkest or scariest places that you had to go to get here? There were many dark places that I had to go. One of them that really stands out was, no matter how much money I make, I always think that I'm going to go broke and I'm not going to have enough for my family. No matter how much security I have, I feel like, you know, right now, for example, right? I feel like the, the, the sky is caving in. Like, I feel like everyone is like, people are dying. There's a pandemic. There's no toilet paper or rubbing alcohol in the store. I went on a hunt to go look for rubbing alcohol. I don't need rubbing alcohol. What do I need rubbing alcohol for? But I'm like, and, I, and then after I, I finally got it, I was like, I got rubbing alcohol. Yeah, baby. And I realized it's kind of like getting another million dollars. It's like getting a, buying another house. It's like all that stuff. We're in a very dark time right now. And I had many moments in my life that are just like this, where I'm running after rubbing alcohol. And then when I get the rubbing alcohol, I realize I do not need rubbing alcohol and I will never need rubbing alcohol in the foreseeable future. And if I need it, I could probably find it. But why are you running off the rubbing alcohol? And I take a moment and I sit down in my car with my face shield. I actually bought a face shield just in case, you know, riots happen and I need to start running through the streets and I want rocks in my face. I start realizing that all this security, all this false security that I think I have for myself, all this is meaningless. All this is meaningless. If you're going to catch coronavirus, there's no alcohol that's going to make you not catch the coronavirus. It just Mm -hmm. is. If you're going to catch it, you're going to catch it. Of course, you should wash your hands. But you don't have to be crazy and have an unopened bottle of rubbing alcohol in your desk in your studio. That doesn't. I'm sure, it's going to help. Just like you know, chase away the bad spirits or something, right? <laughs> <laughs> I want to be spiritual and chase away the bad spirits. What I need to start doing is giving more charity. What I need to start doing is reaching out to the people that I love and reassuring them and letting them know that everything's going to be okay, as opposed mm-hmm. to having a bottle of unopened alcohol. And that's kind of like a reminder for myself. I keep it on my desk mm-hmm. here to remind myself. Stop chasing meaningless things in life. Stop chasing things that are going to potentially bring you some happiness that you got to the end of the tunnel, but ultimately they're not going to bring you fulfillment. And right. so moments, moments like me chasing alcohol, there are so many moments of me just running after it and trying to make it big and like leaving all the amazing opportunities, not being able to smell the roses. So many moments like that. I remember when my partner left me, he decided he's, he can't take it anymore in the business. He was like, he decided he, he doesn't, he, our marketing agencies have lots of ups and downs. You add clients, you lose clients. You add clients and you lose clients. So as you're, if you're trying to double your business every single year, there's going to be a lot of pressure, a lot of cash flow pressure, a lot of issues in trying to grow your business. So going from a million to 2 million to 4 million and continuously trying to double, is there are going to be a lot of issues. So at one point, my partner basically said, I'm done. I no longer want this. And I, and I sat down in my room and I almost started crying. I didn't. But I almost started crying and I was thinking to myself, I'm doomed. I am, I am doomed. This is the end because I don't think I can do this on my own. I needed him. I needed him to start this business. The truth is I didn't need anybody to do this, but I felt like I did. And if you believe something, that's what it is. And I literally called him up and I said, you know that this business is not going to get anywhere. As a matter of fact, it's going to retract and go out of business if you leave. He's like, I need to do what I need to do. And I believe in you. And I, I became really, really sad. And um, for almost a year, I was basically just in my own head. For almost a year, I was basically in my own head, even running away from the business. Was that in your obese smoking period? It wasn't. Was it, was, your, it, was, no, it, was it was in my cheerful, happy times. And I, I already lost the weight at that point. I already lost the weight, most of the weight, I, I should say. I was still you know, cheering on and moving forward. But I was very unsure, and I, but I still haven't found my purpose at that time. I still haven't, you know, I still wasn't comfortable with who I am. I was pushing through, pushing through, pushing through and trying my best, but I still didn't accept myself fully. I heard this one person tell me, he said, Joe, 
The day that you accept yourself for all your flaws, for all your insecurities, the day that you truly start loving yourself and you realize that you are perfect the way that you are, will be the day that you can have a foundation to grow whatever you want to grow from. Because whatever you're trying to grow right now, you're growing it from an unsteady set of beliefs and demons that you have inside yourself to try to prove something to somebody. And that's a house that of cards. That is so powerful, Joe. That is so powerful, right? Like, I feel like we all, like everybody needs to get that and understand that. Like until that clicks, nothing else matters. And even, I feel like it's even something that we have to remind ourselves of, right? Because there's that, the other thing is so ingrained in us and also in, in our culture and our society, right? So there's so much pressure to kind of fall back on. Do you feel like that was a one-time thing and you kind of got it or is it something no that way. you keep reminding yourself No way, of? no way, no way. I got to keep it. I'll give you another example, right? So I got it. They told me I got it for the moment. I was like, okay, I'm perfect the way that I am. I get that I need a foundation. And then all of a sudden somebody tells me I'm a bad father. Somebody sees me, they judge me. They say, you know, you're a bad father because you work a lot and you're not home often. And although you're committed to giving your kids 45 minutes a week for each of your five kids of dedicated one-on-one time, besides telling them that you love them every single day, that doesn't make you a good father. You're a terrible person and a terrible father because you care more about your business than you care about your kids, right? Somebody told me that. And then I started believing it. I started believing, you know what? I'm not a good... And I started asking my kids, am I a good father? And I started looking for validation outside of myself. Not a good idea. And then not a good idea. And, you know, my son would be like, well, if you let me play video games, you're a good father. <laughs> right. my, other, my other son tells me, if you buy me a donut, you're a good father. And then I started, you know, buying an Xbox oh and getting him God, donuts yeah. and started... And then I stopped I mean, when myself. you ask your quick kids something, a question like that, like, who's the, who's the adult in the room, right? Exactly. So then all of a sudden I realized the bottle of alcohol. I got to stop looking for the bottle of alcohol. I got to stop looking for the rubbing alcohol. And instead, I decide that I'm an amazing father. I am the best father that I could possibly be. And I am proud of the father that I am. And I have to, I have to write that down. I have to remind myself that because people are going to question you. People are going to poke at you because of their own insecurities. That person that asked me doesn't believe that they're a good parent. And as a result, they tell me that. They let their own insecurities on me. The same well, thing. Are you, are you a good business and the only owner? Reason it, the only reason it got to you was because you somewhere in there had a belief that you weren't a good father, right? Like they, he was just giving voice to a belief that already existed within you. And once you got a chance, which is, that's the beauty of it, right? So when someone says something like that, and it triggers you, that's just an invitation to say, oh, thank you for bringing my attention to this belief that I didn't even realize I had. But now that I know, I can look at it and question it and realize, no, I don't believe that. And that's the beauty of the pain. That's the beauty of the pain that other people cause you. So if you're in a terrible relationship, thank that person. Because the Mm -hmm. fact that they made it terrible for you means that you're going to grow from it. You're either growing or dying. I'll say this again. You're either growing or dying. Your pain either has purpose or your pain is suffering. So if you're busy suffering, good luck to you. It's because you didn't learn something from the pain. It's because you don't have purpose to your pain. So realize that every pain that you have in your life can help you progress forward if you can find the meaning and learn something from it so that you can grow and keep growing over and over and over from it. So for me, that pain that I felt and asking myself, am I a really good father? Am I not a good father? made me realize that I need to establish boundaries for A, who I spend time with, that's more most important, but also I need to realize and become aware that, you know what, I'm a pretty damn good father. I'm a pretty damn good lover. I'm a pretty damn good CEO. And if somebody doesn't see that, it's because of their own insecurities. And I just need to make sure that I do the best job that I can in whatever role that I have in my life. And that's another thing I want to tell you that I didn't mention yet is the word role. A lot of people mix their identity with their role. A lot of people mix their I with the who they are or, or what they're doing in that moment. And when you decide that you are a CEO and then you become not a CEO, you're completely in crisis mode. When you decide that you are a father and that is who you are and that's how you identify yourself with and then you lose your kids for whatever reason, God forbid, then all of a sudden you become a, not a person anymore. So I, and this is sales training 101. When I'm training salespeople, I'm like, you are not a salesperson. You are a beautiful human being before you're a salesperson. Now wear your sales hat and if somebody attacks that, they're not attacking you, they're attacking your preparation. They're not attacking you, they're attacking your tactic. They're not attacking you, they're attacking your ability to show them that you have value to add. So you just gotta work on that and not feel bad that they attacked you. 
And that's such massive insight to be able to really fulfill on your role. And that's how you can live with more purpose. And here's another thing that I heard about purpose from somebody recently. This person told me that, you know, there's a famous saying, do what you're passionate about and you won't work a day in your life. Do what you love and you won't work a day in your life. Most people can't find a way to really make money from the things that they're passionate about. That's most human beings in general. So what they end up doing is doing whatever makes them money and they do their passion as a hobby. When I heard this person say, he said, flip it around, Joe. Instead of do, do what you love, he said, do everything in your life with passion. Do everything in your life with love. Go ask yourself, am I all in? Am I all in with what I'm doing? Forget about if it's the thing that I'm passionate about. Am I all in? Because when you're 100% into a relationship, when you're 100% into a business, you're living your purpose in that moment because your purpose can change moment to moment. If you want to find your purpose, be in the moment now. Like me and you, we're in the moment. We're rock stars. We're on stage. We're rocking out. If I was on my phone right now and distracted and not being 100% with you right now, you would know that in a heartbeat. But the reason why you're so engaged with me and the reason why the listeners are so engaged is because I am 100% in right now and I'm adding 100% of everything that I have into this microphone, into this conversation, into this, this environment here. So if you can be in more, you're going to be living a life more of purpose and you're going to attract more people to live. The reason why rock stars are so popular is because they're all into their music. The reason why mm-hmm. top comedians are so popular is because even if they're bombing, they're all in. And when you see somebody on stage, it's not all in, you become allergic to that because it reminds you of your own insecurities. All right, man. Amen. I love that. So I want to wrap this up. So this has been amazing. And this is exactly what I needed to hear today. And what I think everyone listening here needed to hear today. I like to think of like, one of the things that we want to do as parents is we want to teach our children everything that we've learned about life, about how to be successful in life. And by that, I don't mean monetarily, although that's a part of it, right? It's as much relationships and health and that sort of creativity or purpose or that special thing that we add, right? What is the thing that you want your kids to take away from what you I used, I used to want that a lot. I used to want my kids to be financially free. I used to want the kid, my kids to go through the journey that I went through and to be able to learn. I always said, I'm not going to support my kids financially. I want them to figure it out on their own. And, so, and, then, I, and then I took a step back and I realized that each of my kids have their own journey. Each of my kids have their own mission, have their own lessons to learn. And who am I to take my kids through my journey? How selfish would that be to deprive my kids of their own journey, whatever that journey needs to be? So what I realize is that my mission in life for my kids is not for me to decide what their journey needs to be, but for me to be a supportive, loving father that's full of love and also some discipline, but full of love to help them be able to maneuver the difficult parts of their life and to help them be able to celebrate and cherish the most beautiful parts of their life. Children need a stable parent. They need stable parents. They need people that they can rely on when they need to rely on them. And they also need parents to stay the hell out of their way as they're continuing to grow. If you sit there and micromanage your plant, you're going to kill your plant. You got to water it, make sure it has sunlight, spray a little bit, give it some love and get the hell out of the way. And that's how I feel with my children. And that's why I feel like I'm such a good father because I'm not micromanaging my kids. I give them love when I'm there. I wake them up in the morning. I make sure they have food and shelter. I make sure they have the love and the discipline that they need. And then I get out of their way. I get out of the way. I'm not I'm making sure they're safe. I ask them all the right questions and I'm out of their way. And I don't feel like I need my needs met from them. And so- I think that's great. I think it's phenomenal. So, so tell me though, so let's like, for the sake of, of uh, experiment here or um, play with this idea, God forbid, that you're gone, that you're not here, right? And you want to leave your kids some kind of note that's going to help them. What would, you, what would that say? Um, I actually wrote it down in one of my books, what I want my kids to know about me. But the idea is that you are perfect the way that you are. You are much more powerful than you have been trained to believe that you are. And you could literally accomplish anything. So get to know yourself and go add value to other people. 
get to know yourself, figure yourself out. And it's a never ending journey to figure yourself out. So go do the work, figure yourself out, get in control of your mind, get in control of your emotions and live your best life because you only get to do this once. Amazing. I love that. Thank you so much. What would you mind letting people know just where they can find you? And I mean, you know, I know you have an agency. I know you're really, really sharp on the LinkedIn specifically, but like, what is, what, what are the services that you offer and where can people find you? So it's really easy to find me. If you go to joelinkedin.com, you can connect with me and follow me on LinkedIn. So definitely reach out to me. Let me know that you heard me on this podcast. joelinkedin.com, really easy to spell. J-O-E, LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, you're always super active on LinkedIn. That's awesome. Yeah, so super active. And if you click on my about section, even if you're not logged into LinkedIn, you can see my about section. I have a list of my companies. I have a list of what I do. You know, we build funnels for companies. We have a LinkedIn training program called Evergreen. We have lots of different tools that can help you be able to go from frustration to motivation, to be able to help you build your business. So definitely check out my LinkedIn, connect with me. And if you want to set up a call to do a little strategy session about your life or about your business, I have some entrepreneurs that contact me for coaching. So I'm happy to support you in any way that I can. I speak to about a thousand people a year. So I'm, I would love to have a conversation with whoever wants to talk about their life, about their purpose, about their meaning, about their business. And I'm always, I always love to share my gift of ideations. I have a gift called ideation. I come up with lots of ideas very quickly. I have a gift of strategy. I'm very strategic. So I love giving my strengths away. So if anybody needs support in that area, I'm happy to help. That's amazing, man. That's amazing. Yeah. And the right time to sort of invest in advertising and marketing and that type of thing is when the economy is great, that's the right time to do it. When the economy is down, that's the right time to do it. It's like, it's always the time to invest in not just in advertising marketing, but in your, in your business and in yourself, right? It's always the time. Yeah. I mean, there's one thing that nobody can take away from you. It's your own personal development. So that's something that I learned early on. Like if I invest in myself, I'm going to have a 10 X result in my business and in my life and whatever I put my focus in. Uh, And in terms of marketing your business, if you're not top of mind, if you're, then you're out of your mind. If you're out of sight, you're out of mind. If you're out of sight, you're out of your mind. You got to stay in sight because when you don't need the revenue, that's great. You should still be marketing because you never know when you're going to need it. So stay top of mind, nurture your clients, nurture your prospects. You know, we're going to be down possibly 50% in April, but I'm not worried because I've been nurturing hundreds of people over the past several years that I can just tap into right now. So there's an endless potential of clients out there and prospects that you can tap into, but you've got to be consistently marketing yourself. All right. Thanks, Joe. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast episode. After 20 years as a serial spiritual entrepreneur, it's my passion to share lessons insights and ideas that I picked up along the way. So please subscribe and share if you found any value from today's conversation. 